Well, I guess we're going to get started here. Make sure everybody's far enough along with their lunch. Our, our presenter today is Dick Anderson. Anderson. Uh, Dick was born in San Francisco during World War II. <clears throat> he has two degrees from Stanford in English, his best language, and film production. He has been a documentary <coughs> film Dr. Watch, huh? uh, documentary filmmaker, a philanthropist, and an international racer of sailboats. The high point of the latter was exactly 60 years ago in 1964. He was 21 when he was a crew member of Constellation, which successfully defended the America's Cup with a 4-0 victory against the British Challenger. Yay, yes. He now lives in San Rafael and drives the third in a series of Ferraris, a 488 Spider. He is the General Secretary of the Fog Alumni Association. Please welcome Dick Anderson. How you doing? Good. Um, they say it's always good to know who your audience is. I know you're all car guys. Uh, how many of you have been on a sailboat? We just came back from Monterey. Very high percentage. How, how many of those of you who raised your hand would say you're real sailors? <laughs> Still, we're we're still like to you. Are you? That's not, that's not bad. Uh, so I can say port and starboard and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, not worry about you know, confusing people. Well, um, I'll do my best in that case. Yeah. Um, slide number one. This was taken uh, not quite a month ago in the Port Rhode Island. The cast of characters in front, one, two, and three, are Peter Brown. Number two is me, obviously and because I look like the guy in the picture. And number three is Steve Van Dyke, who was our Strawberry Taylor and went on to sail in the 1970 America's Cup with Bill Thicker on Intrepid and won that one as well. Behind him are, uh, on the left, Davey McFarland, who was in charge of the uh, ancient yacht uh, Nereus, which was our trial horse. He was uh, in college at the time and later went to business school and ran all the yachts you know that name. And next to him is Jimmy Goldman, who was our team mascot in 1964. His father was the head of the financial side of the syndicate, a very important guy. And uh, Jimmy actually threw the party. More about the Goldmans in a bit. So that was our crew. Uh, one, two, and three are visible, I hope. The rest of the uh, Mary Vans across the bar, some of the nicest people and best sailors I've ever had anything to do with. Extremely uh, interesting group. One of them is missing because he's up the mast. Honey Waitman, right to tag. The picture was taken to, to, was one of the first applications of commercialism in the America's Cup. See, we all have the shiny white shoes on. Those were Randy boat shoes, which were the worst sailing footwear in the history of life. But they gave them to us and they had to take our pictures, so we all made faces, put our fists under our biceps, and did all those wrestling team things. And then we threw them away. <laughs> but the boats were, uh, were made of wood in those days and uh, took a lot of people to sail. And there are more, more people on the boat in this photo because it was in practice. Uh, Putter Brown's on the, sitting on the after deck. Tony <coughs> Wakeman is wandering around and those are my uh, not inconsiderable legs under the boom. That's where we were forced to live. 
<laughs> little, little shed called the Inn at Castle Hill. If you've ever been to Newport or are planning to go there, you might want to stay there. It's, it's right at the bottom of the East Passage and yeah. it commands the entry to the harbor. In that picture, we're actually saluting one of the Navy boats coming into the, into the harbor, which we did for Grimm's because, at least at first, until the word got around, they didn't know what to do. These idiots were shooting cannons and dropping the ensign. And of course, protocol says you've got to drop your ensign in return. It took them about a week to catch on, but they did. Another, another practice shot, me grinding on the other side. But it, as you can see, you know, and again, more people than required, but everybody's doing something. We're, we're uh, just finishing a drive with a spinnaker in that shot. Then let's flash back to the early 50s. I'm gonna say 1951, something like that. That's the third grade class at Grant School, which you can't attend anymore because it no longer exists, but it was at the top of Pacific Heights in Capitol in uh, San Francisco. Beautiful piece of property that was empty for a long time after they tore it down in 71. Anyway, uh, number four in the, in the second row down is Jock Swain, who was basically my best friend. We did all kinds of mischief together and then and for a while thereafter. And just for grins, number five was my second wife, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> But I, I promised I'd involve cars in this discussion, and here's one now. This is a 1931 Cadillac Fleetwood Roadster. It's a V8, not the 16, which was sort of too bad. And it, the car in question was a different color, but it belonged to Jock Number Four's uh, father, John P. Swain. And he was a guardsman, among other things. And uh, we loved that car. We loved that car completely. We got to help wash it and polish it, and we'd go for rides with them sometimes. And most often, we'd go for rides to the San Francisco Yacht Club in Bel Air. Uh, wonderful institution. Been around since 1869. Not in the same place, but it has existed. And the Swains were members. They, they weren't particularly yachty, but they liked to go drink on the deck, which wasn't very big in those days huge now, and uh, they dragged me along to keep Jock out of their out of their hair. The club had two Altoro dinghies, plywood, six feet long, cap, cap rig, single sail, made of cotton, and if you put them away properly, you could keep doing it. My, my parents, parenthetically, could not care a whit about either uh, sailboats at all or cars except as transportation. And that's uh, Swain's father, Big John, and uh, Swain himself later at, at La Jolla. Uh, offered for sale over there are some uh, programs. The, there's one program from 1953, guardsmen racing in uh, Golden Gate Park before the Ottoman Society closed them down. And that was a special uh, fit, you know, treat for me to see because Swain and I sold those programs because his dad, the guardsman, sort of had us do it. I think they were a quarter of these. So Maston Gregory, uh, Phil Hill, all kinds of great people, racing cat allards, all kinds of exotic hardware that we'd never hope to see again. My first uh, sailboat was, the first ride in a real keelboat was this. It was a model of an IOD, which belonged to a lawyer in my father's office, so I got to I got to be the forward hand from time to time. In fact, a lot. It was before foul weather gear was invented. They all had blue wool clothing from Joe Harris. First wave was kind of cold, but after that, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> and I went on to university, as uh, Gary said, down the, down the road with the red tile and sandstone. And my little group of friends were kind of car heads and, as well. And, once in a while, we'd go someplace, and in this case, we went to uh, Laguna Seca, about probably 61, I would say, 60 or 61, and when you could just walk around and be in, in the uh, pits wherever you wanted to be. So we're there, wandering through the pits, and in come two semis, two 
big old multi-wheel uh, tractor trailers and they're brushed aluminum and down the side of each of them it says Cunningham, big black letters. We thought this was about the coolest you've ever seen in your life. And one had the cars and the other had all the tires and the, and the tools and whatnot. And uh, as amazing as that was, 1964, who turns out to be my coach and uh, a member of the syndicate that paid for translation, but Rick Swift Cunningham, who was one of the nicest human beings who ever knew Brad. I mean, he really, he really was completely modest and just everybody's good friend. He and I actually sailed together in what we call the loser's race. At the end of the cup summer, when the Everybody who'd been eliminated got to go race against each other for grins, and because our crew was on vacation, but I didn't have any place to go, Rick said, hey, come with me. So we went out and beat American Eagle in Columbia in 1958 for Briggs and Sale. And that was a lot of fun. So going back to Stanford, my best friend across the hall was a guy named Billy Googleman. He's uh, seen then and now in these, in these photos. We bonded because we'd both been to prep school and we both liked girls and we both liked music and we really liked cars. Except his cars were always much cooler than mine. I had whatever I could get and he had fun stuff, including a, uh, an Elva Courier, of which I had never heard. Basically MGA, engine and running gear transmission with a clever uh, glass body. We weren't old enough to race it in the CCA, so we convinced a guy named Hinman to, to uh, run it one day. I guess it was at Katati, which was uh, fun, so, but we were the big crew and got a lot kicked out of that. So the last day of school, or close to the last day of 1961, after our freshman year, sitting in Billy's office or in his room just talking about whatever, Notice on his desk there's a copy of Sports Illustrated on the right. I looked down at the Sports Illustrated and I go, hmm, Wendigo. It's a famous boat. I've seen, read about it in books because I, I really got into sailing and read and, and so forth, sailed everywhere I could. And I said, Billy, you've never talked about sailing even one day in your life. And, uh, and why do you have this? Because, oh, it's my father's boat. <laughs> no shit. He says, yeah, yeah, would you like to go sailing on it sometime? I said, I think I would. Pretty sure I would, yeah. I'd like to. He says, well, I'll fix you up for the Bermuda race next year, 1962. Bermuda's every, every other year, and then even year. I said, would you really? I said, sure, no, no, no problem. I'll call my dad. Sure enough, I drove across the country in June of 1962. Uh, well, actually, I raced to Hawaii first on a really horrible boat called Rough and Ready, which was perfectly named. It was 19, <laughs> 1961 Transpac, and we uh, actually won second in our class, which is remarkable. So I get dropped off at the Goobleman Residence Center on the Oyster Bay, hard by the Suad, Corinthian Yacht Club. Knock on the door, servant answers. Got Mr. Goobleman there? Uh, just a minute, click. Wait some time, and pretty soon this older, shorter man comes to the door. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, I'm Dick Anderson. I'm here to sail on Bermuda. I'm Bermuda. My name's Billy to me. Oh. <laughs> Billy had pretty much neglected to follow through with his end of the deal. <laughs> so, um, there was some embarrassment, but then he said, well, the mate has just quit on my boat, and uh, if you want to be a professional for a couple of days, we'll at least get you as far as Newport and maybe get a ride from there. And I did. I crewed on when to go and then became the, the uh, downwind helmsman on Grey Lady. Absolutely beautiful Sparkman Stevens 56 footer built in uh, Sweden. More like furniture than any sailboat I've ever been on. With some really, really nice people as well. And we did all right and had a nice time and then I picked up a boat going to Europe, because I thought that'd be a good idea. So I sailed on a Dutch boat called Stormvogel, 73 foot catch boat in South Africa, across the Atlantic by way of the Azores, and then raced all over Europe, 
when it was my four deck crew, the two guys to my right are standing on the floor attached. They're not tiny. In fact, Richie Crow was very tiny. Sailing along. Billy, by the way, uh, continued to race cars in this in this country. Dropped out of Stanford because he all he wanted to do was go to England and race cars. But this was, I think, a Formula B, which he raced at Tahoe, and I was uh, part of his pit crew. And then uh, we actually stood up for each other in our respective weddings in the late '60s. Then I got, had to get a job, so I did. I made movies mostly about sailing, but anything else I could get away with. That was the Big Boat series in '78, I guess. And I was uh, filming the America's Cup in 1977 with the irrepressible Ted Turner. Uh, it was a lot of fun and really a good guy, despite what other people might think. Unfortunately, now he's got Louis Body dementia, which is not something you'd like to have. And this was the biggest payday of the whole thing, shooting a 35 millimeter commercial for Schlitz beer just before it went out of business. <laughs> they they uh, had been with a certain agency and they had a bad series of ads, and so they hired J. Walter Thompson to try to save their bacon and uh, they asked us to produce a series of Be Like Us commercials, you know, where you do something fun and then you drink the beer and anybody who drinks the beer will be just like you. <laughs> and anyway, great payday. So as to the America's Cup itself, then and now, vote on the left, no, no surprise, this constellation, full and by with a uh, main and jib and, and background sails, wooden hull, lead ballast, and on the right is a so-called AC-75, which is racing right now in, of all places, Barcelona, because Barcelona was the high bidder, and the New Zealanders uh, didn't want to host it at home, so they put it up for, up for grabs. And they're very, very different boats, as you can see. 12 meters stuck in the water, uh, big, big old lead keel for ballast to keep it from tipping over, shaped to uh, combine with the sail plan to give it a certain amount of drive. Whereas the modern AC-75 is a, is a foiling boat. It has uh, foils on either side, which are raised and lowered electronically, by the way. They have a big electric motor to do that. And a, uh, a foil on the rudder, and they have two sails. They don't adjust them very much, but that, that's all they have. So this is a little bit of footage of what it was like to sail a 12 meter. My old friend Dennis Connor. Well, he's sort of a friend. He's he's not really your friend unless you sail with him a lot. But, uh, but not, not not so not so much. Just just a little background. Anyway, this is this is a spinnaker set uh, at a weather mark. We got we got permission to be on the race boats with cameras uh, one race a year. But this will give you some idea of the teamwork and choreography of, of managing one of these yachts, which is, uh, teamwork is, is, the, is really the key to the whole thing. This is uh, courageous chasing freedom at this point. But uh, 11 guys all very much involved and as we like to say, no one guy could win a sailboat race on these boats, either, either as the helmsman or the tactician, but any one of us could sure lose it. And these, these uh, modern AC-75s are different. As you can see, you, you, you really can't see anybody. You can see the tops of, you know, the tops of some heads and the, and the two hulls. They, they now have two helmsmen, so nobody runs across the boat anymore. You've got a starboard helmsman and a port, there's technical terms again, port helmsman. And uh, the guys who are important are the helmsman and the guy who manages the foils. Here's some footage, I hope, of uh, 
of these things underway. The uh, it's it's lifted from uh, television and it's the narration is in Italian. But as you can see, there's a whole lot of uh, you know, marvelous video overlay that uh, helps you appreciate what's going on. But whoop, I didn't mean to do that. I wanted. I was hoping to stop the. So it, there is no way to do a still hold. Oh, more's the pity. Anyway, I was going to explain a little bit more about how these things work. From a from a naval architecture point of view, they're they're really quite marvelous. They're turning a a, a floating sailboat into an ice boat, basically. And if you understand ice boats, you realize that they have almost no friction uh, with the water because there's no water. It blades on ice. So putting these things on foils reduces all the friction on the hull, for one thing. And putting T-shaped foils on the, on the bottom of, of the arms uh, give you the ability to control the height of the right. The, the foils themselves have flaps on the back of them. And one of the most important people on the boat is the guy who is trimming that, that whichever tab is in the water. See, you see a pretty good shot of the foil itself there. But they sail on, as an ice boat will, or as any boat sails on what we call apparent wind, which is a vector of the wind that's blowing across the planet and, and the apparent wind that's made by your boat passing through whatever wind there is. So what it does is the boat goes faster, it drags the apparent wind forward and forward and forward. So these things are almost entirely hard on the wind, even when they go around the top mark on a reach which they're about to do here. See, he eased the main about four inches, whereas we, on a big boat, we let the main all the way out. And the races often end up like this. They're, you know, somebody falls off the foils and they, they basically fall out of, the, out of the world. Anyway, um, to close my end of the story, this is the the 2019 12-meter worlds. I uh, chartered a boat under the number two called Defender, with, which I manned with all old, good old shipmates of mine, and we served in the 12-meter worlds in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, we didn't win, but then again, we weren't last either. The, uh, again, we had 11 guys who spent about an hour and a half training, and then we were racing, and we had more fun than you can possibly have. So if that uh, gives you any information or inspires any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Very cool. All at once. How much did the Constellation weigh? Constellation weighed about 70,000 pounds. Current boats weigh 20, maybe. Maybe not, and maybe not that much. But you know, they're, they're all all built in carbon. Heaviest thing on them are the batteries that run the motors that lift the foiling arms up and down. And the the, uh, the crew comprises seven people, I guess, four of whom are cyclists who don't need to know how to sail. They're they're people with strong quadriceps, and they pedal and pedal and pedal. When we crank the winches, it was to bring the pole back or trim the jib in or do something specific. These guys just pump all day long, all night, or <laughs> for the whole 25 minutes of the race, accumulating hydraulic pressure against the accumulator so that the guy trimming the sails can open or close a valve with the hydraulic. Makes them go. Anyway, question? Yes, yeah, that's a great question. Well, oh. what did they do? So now I know why they were kind of too Well, the, 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 four, the four cyclers who, in any rational world would be replaced by an engine. When, they, when, the, when the catamarans raced out here in, in 2013, they had diesel engines on the, on the aft uh, cross, crossbar building up the hydraulic pressure so that they could handle the sails. And they saved a certain amount of weight and, and a lot of payroll because in 1964, we'd, we'd have paid them to be on the boat, much less getting paid by them. Today they're paying 
and starting later wages to people who get on the boat and pedal. Go figure. Let's see, what do I think? I, I think two things. I think that they're, they are marvelous in the sense of, of the naval architecture. The idea that you can get a boat that will pop out of the water on foils and sail around at 40, 45 miles an hour, top end, is, is really quite marvelous. On the other hand, as a racing vehicle, I have no time for them at all. Their, their tactics are almost negligible. The, uh, the, the, the whole game is, is staying up on the foils. If you, if you don't, you're, you're toast, unless the other person does too. There's almost no boat for boat, port starboard, windward, leeward. You know, the intricacies of the racing rules are wasted on these things. One of the reasons being the separation is often so great. The other is you don't want to get too close because at 45 mile an hour, you can do some serious damage. So uh, I like the way we did it, and not so much the way they're doing it now. Sir? What are the sails made of on the new boats? Uh, they're laminations, most of carbon and mylar. Carbon to, to uh, provide strength and mylar just to keep them together and, and hold the decals on them. So you don't pull them down and store them? You're leave them up? No, they, they get flaked they carefully, lowered and so forth. Uh, try not to make the creases too, uh, <laughs> too hard. And they go through a lot of sails. Yeah. Even, even though carbon makes strong sails, they, they have a lot of money and they have to use it. Plus, plus they provide a lot of space for advertising, <clears throat> which I don't find all that attractive. Uh -huh. Since, since the tactics are so minimal in today's racing, how, and if both boats stay out of the water, how, who determine, how, does, how does the winner get determined? The, the, the biggest part of the game is the start. And of course, the, the big part of the game was the start in our, sure. in our racing too. But in our racing, we had 10 minutes between the warning, five minute gun, and then gun, and we, chase each other around, using the racing rules to try to get a controlling position so that we could force the other guy over the line early or drive him away from the line, attack and come back ahead of him. Lots of, lots of fun and games. These guys just mill around and look at their computers to see what the time and distance to the line is and try to adjust the boat speed to, to be there at the right time. Very, very little boat for boat testing. And if, if for tactical stuff, so if you if you win the start, your job is just to stay ahead, not necessarily covering. Just going as fast as you can. There's a certain amount of where on the course is the wind blowing harder than it might be on the other parts. So you know, whoever can guess that correctly is going to maybe have a chance to win or to pick up an advantage. Plus, as you can see in the video, there are these artificial boundaries that are shown by gray lines on the water, which actually aren't there in real life. But if you get close to one, your computer goes beep, 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 beep. Danger, danger, danger. So you can get penalized for sailing outside the course, which is nonsense. In our day, we sailed out in the ocean, so you sail whatever you want, as long as you thought it was gonna win you the race. And in other races, you just wanna go crunch. <coughs> Port and starboard uh, rules the same? The rules are the same. They're almost never employed. I mean, in, in the sense of, of disputed. Uh, again, they're going so, the closing speed is so fast on these things that you, you, you really don't want to take a chance coming across on port. Uh, we were talking earlier about the race in 2013 where the foiling catamaran from New Zealand attacked before their hydraulics had built up enough power very nearly went in the drain. Well, that's that doesn't happen very much with these guys. But the, the rules are the same. It's just you don't need to know them. <laughs> the 
there are there are none of your 12 meters. <laughs> the, the, the newest of them were built for the 87 series in Australia, which was which really was one of the very very best America's Cups ever. I mean, Gage Rose off Canal, lots of wind, beautiful, really pretty. But uh, that's and they want the the people who run the America's Cup decided to go away from the 12s after that. So that was the last boat to be built. Defender, the boat I raced in in 19, was built for the 83 campaign and did horribly in the trials because the dog would not run, as they say. But it floated and we had fun with it. And various of them have been really worked on. Some, some of them have been brought up to right now standards with, with uh, sail handling gear, high speed winches and whatnot. But they're still little 12 meter boats. There, there have been a couple of Swedish built boats. Sveria was built for 77, the Pelly Pedersen boat, which was interesting, but not very fast. But there, there are a lot of a lot of old 12 meters in very, very nice shape in Europe, especially in Scandinavia. Yeah, no, they're, they're such pretty boats. You, I mean, you just sit there and look at them for hours, but, uh, at least if you're me. In the pink. With the fin fields, um, th why did they stop pursuing various kinds of design with fin fields instead of going to a cabinet? Well, they, the, <laughs> the decision to go to catamaran, to a catamaran was made by Dennis Connor in 1988 uh, when the Kiwis challenged so-called data gift challenge, and they pres they said let's race in boats that are 95 feet on the water, 90 feet on the water, at maximum, and uh, and let's race. And Dennis and John Marshall and this little brain trust went, wait a minute, why build a big old big old single hull boat when we can build a 60 foot catamaran that'll do circles around it? So that was the first introduction of multi-hulls to the America's Cup. It was simply an expedient to save, save money and guarantee a victory. As you probably heard, there was a lot of court going to court uh, about that. And at the end of the day, the deed of gift doesn't say no catamarans. It says, shall be between 40 feet and 90 feet on the load water line. So Dennis, Dennis won, and that wasn't the immediate uh, transfer to catamarans. They went with the so-called international ACC boats, which were much like 12 meters, operated the same way, a little bit bigger, few more people in the crew, but same same traditional main jib, spinnaker, up sails, down sails, racing rules, tag shot, all sorts. But then there was the next renegade challenge after the last cup in 2007 in Valencia, was uh, the, a renegade challenge between Larry and the Swiss, which oddly enough was in a trimaran if you were Larry, and then uh, a catamaran if you were Ernesto. Larry won, so they brought it to San Francisco, 2013. Everybody's, everybody brought a foil and catamaran at that point. And we've been in multi hulls ever since. So we're 
getting close to the end of uh, Cuba, Punta Maya. The race course goes from Miami down through the Bahamas, down the back of the Bahamas, down to the east end of Cuba, down the Cayman Gulf, and finishes at the northwest end of the island of Jamaica. And I love saying that. And uh, so we're, we're getting close to Punta Maya, and here comes a, a World War I fabric biplane. <laughs> and flying along about 50, 50 miles an hour. Turner runs below, grabs the ensign. Swing it over. That's the American flag. <laughs> Started swinging it over his head and says, Come down and fight like a man. So forth and so on. <laughs> very, very patriotic. <laughs> moments, moments later, he announced to me that his team was playing my team that night. By this, he meant the following. The team in the NBA, the Atlanta Hawks, I guess they were, was, which he owned at the time, was playing the team from the city in which I live, Seattle Supersonics. And we had to have a bat. I said, Ted, I'm a little dizzy grabbing your boat. And I be back about, no, no, we got a bat, we got a bat. So, okay, I'll bet you five dollars. Yeah. He stays up, we're on opposite watches. He stays up our whole watch, scanning the radio, trying to get the score. Finally, Radio Free somewhere announces that the Hawks had won by two, but two bucks in over, or two points in overtime. Pay up, pay up, God damn it, Task Bay makes fast friends. <laughs> so, I wrote, so I wrote him a check. We had checks in those days. And I said, you're gonna cash this and I'm gonna keep the check and when you get to be president, it'll be valued. <laughs> there are lots of other stories. <laughs> Okay. So, so it sounds like there could be a parallel with heart technology and Formula One versus the Grand Prix days. You know, you've got F1 races and then historic racing. Is there something similar for sailing where you see these modern ships and, you know, the old ships that are still around to do racing still? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the uh, this, these, this slide and the previous one are basically vintage racing in 12 meters. Uh, basically, older people with old, no longer current boats out there just banging away, uh, very much like vintage car racing. And, and at the other end of the spectrum, there, there are some parallels between uh, Formula One and the, the current DC-75 to the extent that it's, it's all about technology. And the drivers are the drivers certainly certainly matter, but uh, boy, the technology is, as we all know, so 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 important and uh, key in determining who wins and who doesn't. I mean, look at look at McLaren; they figured something out for sure, and, and now Max is sitting back there going, "Something happened here," <laughs> and uh, but, but it, and. Uh, it makes it interesting at any rate. But uh, there are people who like vintage racing and there are people like, who like the current F1. Yes, sir. Is the Constellation still afloat? Funny you should ask. Um, no. Oh. She, briefly, she was sold after the 64 campaign to Baron Beek, the Frenchman who wanted to get into the Cup and ultimately did get in the Cup starting in 1970. But he bought the boat, our boat, and he bought the, the English boat, Sovereign, and, and had people sail them against each other in the Mediterranean, mostly around the air, just as a way of developing crew and whatnot, simultaneously working on boat design so that he could, he could get into the cup. And, and he did, and he didn't ever do very well, but he, he was an interesting fellow. But when Constellation was no longer useful, she was sold first to one fellow and then somebody else who would just take them cruising. And the, an Englishman owned her in about 1985, I guess, was towing her in the east end of the Mediterranean at night with a crew with nobody on the 12. And she got hobby horsing and stuck her bow in and started taking on water. And, before you knew it, the total line was pointed straight down. 
they cut the tow line. And it's now in a thousand feet of water. And I would, I once asked Bob Ballard if he was in the vicinity, could he please find her and, and get her brought back? And she was a really pretty boat and very, very much loved by all who had anything to do with her. Jerry. I have no idea. I, re I really don't. It's, it's stupid money. I mean, it's it's really, really stupid money. There are, there are something, somebody, well, F1 teams are huge. A couple hundred people or more at all levels. And these boats have crews, they have operations comprising hundreds of people. And of course, some of them are marketing people, selling space on the sales and all and whatnot. But, uh, it's, it's just stupid, stupid money. And by comparison, and I guess, again, this is dollars from 60 years ago, the budget for Constellation was about, and we looked, we actually looked at the budget on paper in the in a museum in Newport when we, where that first picture was taken. The whole total budget was $850,000 for buying, designing the boat, building the boat, renting the shed at Castle Hill for the whole summer, feeding us all a lot, uh, uh, getting the sails built and fixed and so forth. And then they sold the boat for $400,000, so they got almost half of it back. And I, I don't know what that is in adjusted dollars, but it's sure not what they're spending today. Ernesto Bertarelli, who was in the Cup and owned the Cup for a couple of campaigns, is now back in racing for Red Bull. And uh, he's liable to be sent home uh, after the first series. There is, there is one boat will be eliminated in terms of uh, dollars spent for moments on the race course. It's going to be a very, very silly number. <laughs> are, there, are there any other series for the AC boats besides the America's Cup? No. No. Are there, are that, no. Is that style boat? Well, the, the, the closest you get is the so-called Sail GP, yeah. which are 50-foot catamarans on foils. These are the same boats that were literally the same actual hulls that were used in Bermuda in 17 when the Kiwis won it back from Larry. And they've been all rendered one design, all made exactly the same. And uh, they're, they're, they have a series, as you probably know, that goes all over the world with the world's worst announcers. I don't know why. <laughs> very, very strange, often unintelligible folks. The Olympic series, Sailing Series, those are all on a little foil boat. Do you know have you on all of the development of that boat? There seems to me there's only one foiling boat, I think, in the Olympics. I think that's the Nacra catamaran maybe uh, there <clears throat> one of one of the first race boats to be popularized was the so-called international Moth, which is it, it is a development class as it's called the rule is the boat can't be longer than 11 feet end of rule and uh, John McNeil and I had the use of one in, you know, 70 years ago in, in Belvedere and it didn't didn't foil, but it was a lot of fun. But that that they very quickly figured out how to make those little fellows foil, and uh, they look like a lot of fun to sail. But they're but they're also expensive. I don't think there are any other so-called foilers in the Olympics. And and now the Olympics is only small boats. It's ding, all all dinghies and, uh, and, and uh, they have kites now and. Uh, which was really stupid to race kites in Marseille because you, you don't have six or eight knots of wind, you can't, you can't do it. And so they, they did it badly. But in the good old days, they had six meters and even eight meters in, in the Olympics, but that's too undemocratic for the Olympic Committee. You can't have rich people. There you go. I'm just calculating. So an elite bicyclist gets puts out about three quarters of a horsepower. I think. 